Welcome to College Algebra, Chapter 1, Section 7. In this section, we're going to talk about linear inequalities and absolute value inequalities. And these notes that we're using were adapted originally for Blitzer's College Algebra 5th edition. We'll talk about some concepts, we'll talk about some processes, and we'll be doing all of that while we're looking at some example problems. <clears throat> Linear inequalities and absolute values are going to require heavy use of interval notation. So we'll make sure to review that. I'll point out first that when you're working with a strict inequality, like a less than or a greater than symbol, we're going to see the use of parentheses and if we have a less than or if we have a less than or equal to symbol or greater than or equal to symbol then we'll see these square brackets and sometimes we'll see a mixture of the use of both of those every once in a while we'll be working with half of the number line so we will have either a parenthesis or a square bracket and then the number line will be shaded all the way to the right or all the way to the left, which means we're using infinity or negative infinity. And infinity, as you can see there, or just below that, negative infinity, you see here, both of those symbols, negative and positive infinity, are always going to use a parenthesis, whether it's on a number line or if we're working with interval notation. So that covers parentheses and brackets in interval notation. And here you go. This is the best summary of all of those different situations. And we're going to see uses of those as we go through example problems. But just be mindful that the strict inequality, and when I say strict inequality, I mean does not have the or equal to symbol. The strict inequality will correspond to a parenthesis which is sometimes called an open bracket. And if it does have the or equal to symbol, then we will be using the square bracket or closed bracket. If you wanted to even take a screenshot of that and print it out or use it as reference later, I'll take myself out of the corner of there and erase these couple of circles. And if for some reason screenshotting that is beneficial to you, you can go ahead and do that now. And then I'll rejoin you and let's look at an example problem. Express this interval in set builder notation. Set builder notation is usually used when you have more than one restriction. But as you can see in this middle column in the table we were just looking at, the middle column represents set builder notation, and I'll articulate my way through that. First, I'm going to take this interval, however, and put it on a number line. I like the visual of using a number line. So here we've got negative five, and sometimes I'll put zero on the number line just as a reference point, but negative five, and this negative five has a square bracket next to it. So you might see a square back bracket appear on a number line, or you might see it, and you originally learned about the idea of including this value of negative five, it would usually appear with a solid dot or a closed circle or a colored in circle. And then our shading goes all the way up to positive infinity. So some shading will be there. And then you'll see an arrow that indicates the shading goes all the way up to the right. And that might give you a better relation to the format that you're used to with that closed circle. If this had been a parenthesis, then we would be seeing an open circle right here. And then when we 
think about what x values have been shaded here on the number line, I would describe this as the shading includes all of the x values that are greater than or equal to negative 5. Notice in this middle column in set builder notation, at least in these four examples, that the x is appearing sort of first in each one of these inequality statements. And that's pretty typical. Is it necessary for x to appear, to appear on the left-hand side? Could I equivalently write this statement and say negative 5 is less than or equal to all x values? Yes, but is it typical to write it that way? No. All right, now let's, oh, we're supposed to be graphing this on a number line also. Well, that takes care of that, perfect. Let's put it into set builder notation also. We're gonna use this pretty familiar format and we're gonna drop it into these set braces. As I write it, I'm gonna read it. This is the set of x values such that x is greater than or equal to negative five. And then we can close our set braces. That was not my best greater than or equal to symbol, so I'm just gonna put that in there one more time. And that is set builder notation. So you were given interval notation, we've got the number line, and we have set builder notation, which includes this pretty familiar notation. Intersections and unions, you'll see how this is going to become uh, sort of an integral part of solving some of these, in particular, absolute value equations momentarily, but you should be familiar with the notation. This is the intersection symbol. This is the union symbol. This is how you read it, A intersection B. You could read this as A union B. And what intersection is asking us for is basically, what do A and B have in common? And the union symbol, just like when two things unite, they are coming together, they're joining together. And, and we're gonna see that. We're gonna join together uh, a, a couple of sets of options sometimes and what that's gonna indicate is that values from A or values from B might be, or will be, solutions to whatever the equation or statement is that we're working with. But sometimes you can't choose from one or the other. You can only choose options that come from both. If you had to make two people happy, and there were, uh, if two people go to a restaurant and they're trying to decide well, what should we order to share between us? Person A lists some options that they'd like to have from the menu. Person B lists the options that they'd like to have from the menu. And if they're gonna have a successful meal together, they better choose one of those meals that their list of options have in common. That would be the intersection of their two list of menu items that they would like to have. If you took the union of those two lists, for one, you would end up with a lot of food on the table, potentially. And for two, if person A, I'm really going on a tangent here, but I like this illustration. I like the analogy of using the menu options. If person A says that they would like uh, a food that has a triangle next to it and a menu option that has a square next to it, and, and, and that's it, they're pretty picky. They only like those two options. And person B says, well, I like that triangle stuff, but really I only, uh, well, maybe I'd also like the option that has the circle next to it. And ooh, this option with the star next to it looks pretty good. If I were to unite those list of menu options, all the food that we would end up with on the table would consist of the triangle menu option and the square, and the circle, and the star. 
Notice that I didn't include the triangle option twice. You would only order one of those meals. Above that, the intersection conversation that we had said, well, we're only going, going to order the things that both people might like to have, and so we would only be ordering the menu option that corresponded to the triangle. If there were more items in common between both of those sets of choices, choices by person A and choices by person B, if they have more options in common, then we would include those other options. Here we're going to use not as much of a real life example as two people at a restaurant. Uh, we're gonna be looking at using intervals on a number line. And we're gonna do this visually. So I'm going to put down two number lines and I'm going to put a zero on both of those number lines just to show you that they line up. And the first interval that goes from negative infinity up to six, open at both ends, says that we start at the number six. Well, that's not true. Really, I like to look at interval notation from left to right. So I'm gonna start at negative infinity and I'm gonna shade my number line all the way up to the number six. And I should put an arrow at this end of my shading. And I'm gonna put a parenthesis at the number six to indicate that we are excluding, we're not including six as part of that interval. And then on the next number line, we're going to be working with values that start at two and go all the way up to nine, closed at both ends. So here's the number two and here's the nine. And let's do some shading there. We're going from two up to nine, however, because it's closed at both ends, I'm going to put a square bracket at both ends. So we're including the values of two and nine. And since this problem wants us to find the intersection of those two intervals, we're asking ourselves, what do they have in common? Or where do they overlap? And it's a little bit easier to see that because these two number lines vertically are lining up with each other. So, on this upper number line, there are some values in here, but th this number line down here doesn't have those shaded, so they don't have those in common. But I think you can see pretty clearly that this is where they start to overlap or have some shading in common. And the first potential value where that happens is at the number two. Do these two shaded regions have the number two in common? Definitely, right here, the number two is shaded. But on the number line below, is the number two included in that shaded interval? And the answer is yes, because that square bracket says that that shading starts at the number two and includes the number two. So we're looking good at the number two. I put a square bracket there in order to include it. And then the shading continues going up to the number six and I wonder, do both of these shaded number lines include shading of the number six? The lower one pretty clearly does because it's right in the middle of that shaded region. But the upper number line, because there's a parenthesis right here, that parenthesis means we're not including the number six. It's as though there's an open circle right there. So these two shaded regions do not include or do not have the number six in common. The bottom one has it, the top one does not. And since they don't have the number six in common, I'll indicate that they don't have it in common by putting a parenthesis at the six. And this is your final answer to describe the intersection of those two intervals.
other than just purely looking at intersection and union, we're going to move into some inequality statements, linear inequalities. They're linear, they're called linear, because look at this expression right here. Doesn't that look a lot like y equals mx plus b, except it says ax plus b? If you graphed it, it would look a lot like a line. So that's why we're calling them linear inequalities, one variable. Obviously, we're only working with x. Let's go into this example problem where it asks us to solve the inequality. And, and where am I going to do that? I guess I'll do the work for this problem uh, down here since there's some open space right here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is something that you probably would not think to do is I think that a lot of my students would, would initially want to distribute multiplication by negative 2. I'm not going to do that. You could. I'm not going to. And I'm not going to do it so that I can illustrate something else. I'm going to take this initial statement and I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2. So the negative 2 will cancel from the left hand side leaving us only with 3x plus 1 and on the right hand side 4 divided by negative 2 makes negative 2x and the positive 8 divided by negative 2 makes negative 4 and how does this negative 2 impact my inequality sign? That's why I did this. When you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, you need to switch the sign or change the direction of that inequality symbol. So it was sort of opening to the right, I guess you could say, and now it's going to open to the left. My very fancy illustrations there. Okay, so let's get this written down. And again, if you're the kind of person who uses a highlighter, I highly recommend somehow putting a note in your notes that highlights the fact that, again, when you multiply or divide an inequality by a negative number, you must switch the sign. Most of us have heard that before. It's a matter of trying to remember it when you're in the throes of doing a problem. Okay, what do we do from there? From there, really, this works the same way as solving a regular equation. Try to get x all alone on one side of the statement. I'm going to add 2x to both sides. I usually recommend getting your variables sorted out first. I'm off the screen. Why am I off the screen? Let's move this over. There we go. So I'll add 2x to both sides. That gives us 5x plus 1 is less than negative 4. Then I'll subtract 1 from both sides. So that 5x is less than negative 5. And then I'll divide both sides of my equation by positive 5 in order to get rid of that 5. Those 5's cancel. And on the right-hand side, negative 5 divided by 5 is negative 1. This is one way to present your final answer. If you wanted to put it in set builder notation, it's very easy. It's the set of x values such that, and then you just copy and paste this into the set builder notation, and then close your set braces. So that is another way to represent your final answer using set builder notation on a number line. Here's negative 1. We like all of the x values that are less than negative 1. So I'm going to do my shading. Less than, where are the x values that are less than negative 1 on a number line? They are to the left of the number negative 1. So I'm going to do my shading to the left. I'll put my arrow on there. So I'm shading all the way down to negative infinity. And we really need to put a parenthesis on there. Because it's a strict inequality, we don't want to include the value of negative 1 in our solution. And that parenthesis is going to visually exclude the negative 1. If we want to turn this finally into interval notation, we can do that. And I really like um, taking a number line and converting it into interval notation. 
because I can look at the number line and sort of read it from left to right and drop it into interval notation. So how far does this shading, let me try that again. How far does this shading, how far does that go to the left? I think you'll say that the answer is it goes all the way down to negative infinity. And how far to the right does the shading go? Well, it goes up to negative one. Perfect. When we go all the way down to negative infinity, can we ever actually get there to include it in our solution set? The answer is no. That's how I try to think of it to remind myself to use a parenthesis on both negative and positive infinity. So there's that parenthesis. And I think you can see from our number line that since we're excluding the value of negative one, that also needs to take a parenthesis. And so this would be your final answer using interval notation. So this problem just said to solve the inequality. We've solved it and then we've presented our final answer every way that we can. Inequalities with unusual solution sets, every once in a while you'll run across an inequality that doesn't have a solution. If it doesn't have a solution, sometimes you'll be able to write no solution, but sometimes, like in a multiple choice situation, you'll see a final answer option, A, B, C, or D, as this circle with a slash through it. That's the same thing as no solution. Uh, another sort of unusual scenario is this one. X is always going to be less than X plus 1. So what values would satisfy that statement? All of them. All real numbers. So maybe an answer option says all real numbers. Another possibility is that you'll see this weird looking R. This R represents the set of all real numbers. You could also see Using interval notation, you can imagine shading the number line from all the way to the left, all the way to the right, from negative to positive infinity. So all of those are synonymous with all real numbers. We also have compound inequalities. A compound inequality is a pair of inequalities although I suppose you could have three of them, but we're gonna see two of them in, the, in this course. Two separate inequalities which have the word and between them. You can take an inequality like this one and you'll notice that this portion of this inequality and this portion of this inequality are identical. They both contain that two x plus one. When you have a compound inequality like that, it can be rewritten as one sort of three-part inequality. We'll see those. And when you work on them, you perform the same operation to all three regions, as I call them, the left and the middle and the right. And the goal is, typically, to isolate your variable in the middle region. So let's try to solve this compound inequality. This is some pretty basic arithmetic in order to pull this off. We're gonna to try to isolate that x value that's in the middle. So I'm gonna add three everywhere, plus three here and plus three here and plus three here, although I don't normally write underneath my statements like that. We end up with a six on the left, only a four x in the middle, and a 22 on the right. And then we need to divide all three regions by four. So we end up with six fourths, which will end up being two thirds, is less than x, is less than 22 over four, which will end up being 11 over two. Let's go ahead and write that. We'll simplify our fractions still. That is a viable final answer. In order to turn it into set builder notation, we put in our set braces, the set of x values such that, put this compound inequality statement in the middle, 
and then close your step braces. So that's uh, turning our final answer into an answer that's written using set builder notation. This one's pretty easy in set builder notation uh, with this compound inequality in particular to convert it into a number line. The three halves comes down to here, the 11 halves comes down to here. You would want to label those three halves and not pi, just 11 halves. And the shading is going to be happening in between them. And then be careful on the left end by the three halves, because we have the or equal to symbol, that needs a square bracket. And on the right end, we have a strict inequality, no or equal to symbol. So that end's going to take a parenthesis. And then converting this number line solution into interval notation. We know we have the three halves. We know we have the 11 halves and we can bring those symbols down with us also. Square bracket, closed on the left end, parenthesis, open interval on the right end. And that's your answer using interval notation. Not too bad. Granted, I've been practicing for a long time, but the arithmetic isn't tough. Just making sure that you have the notation down is what we really need to be practicing, I think, maybe in this section more than anything. What about when we take inequalities and mix them with the absolute value symbol. Again, it's not, it's not difficult. We're not adding any new math, really. It's a matter of how to start these problems. There are only two scenarios that we run into with absolute value inequalities. Once you isolate the absolute value, once you have the absolute value all alone on one side of the statement and the these notes are giving us a couple examples. Here the absolute value is all alone on the less than side. Here the absolute value is all alone on the greater than side. Those are the two scenarios. And let's look at the first one. If your absolute value is on the less than side, this is a trick that I use. I didn't learn this trick long ago, but it has stuck with me. It's been very beneficial. Because the absolute value is on the less than side, in my head, I now do this. I say less than. Because the word and in there reminds me that it's going to be a compound inequality, where I could conceivably write it as two separate inequalities, or I could write it as one three-part inequality. If the greater than symbol is on, or sorry, if the absolute value symbol is on the greater than side, the trick that sort of follows this mnemonic, so to speak, is don't just think of it as greater than, think of it as great or than. And the word or is going to hopefully compel us to use this format where we end up having two inequality statements separated by the word or. Just a few moments ago, we talked about having two inequality statements with the word and between them. That allowed us to write one compound inequality. But when you have the word or in there, they need to remain separate. Whatever strategy it is that you use in order to remember which one is which, doesn't matter to me. But figure out a strategy that's going to help you decide what to do in these two different scenarios. Otherwise, the arithmetic that you know how to do already is going to be wasted because you're just going to be rolling the dice on which route to take depending on the problem. All right, so we've got a couple of practice problems to work on here. The first problem has the absolute value already isolated on the less than side of the statement. So I know that we're going to be turning this into two separate statements. How do I do that? What do those two statements look like? The first one is going to look exactly like this original statement, except it won't have the absolute value bars. Just move that up a little. All right. 
So we have 3 times the quantity x minus 1 over 4 is less than 6. Now this is on the less than side. So mm, let me just move my arrow a little bit. Because we don't actually have to write this as two separate inequalities with the word and between them, let's learn how to just go immediately to writing this as a compound inequality. So here I've rewritten the original statement without any absolute value bars. And then here comes the sort of interesting part. I'm going to take this same inequality symbol here. I'm going to write it over here. And I'm going to take the number 6 in this case, and I'm going to write its opposite over here. Put some kind of notes in your notes that articulate in a way that you'll understand when you review your notes again later the setup process of this compound inequality. When the absolute value is isolated on the less than side of the statement, that's the indicator that we're going to be building a compound inequality. How do I build the compound inequality? We rewrite the original statement without the absolute value bars and then we have to use the same symbol, in this case a less than symbol. We move that over to the other side of the statement and we use the opposite of the constant value. 6 became negative 6 in this case. What do we do from there? We work it the same way we did that problem uh, maybe five minutes ago or something. We're going to work each of these three regions until we have x isolated in the middle. I'm going to multiply all three regions by 4 in order to get rid of that denominator. So I'll put a little note over here, times 4. Notice I haven't distributed the 3. Why didn't I distribute the 3? Because my goal in this problem is to get stuff away from the variable x. I don't want to move the 3 closer. I want to get rid of it. So in the very next step, we're going to get rid of it. Let's divide everything by 3. I divided by positive 3, so I don't have to switch my inequality symbols. Last step, add 1 to all three regions. Perfect. The x values that are the solution to the original statement are the x values between negative 7 and positive 9, excluding the negative 7 and positive 9. In interval notation, we have parentheses at both ends. It's an open interval at both ends in order to exclude those two values. So there it is in interval notation for you. The other problem we were given to practice is this one. Here the absolute value statement is on the greater than side. So it must be that this is going to turn out to be one of those problems where it's two separate inequalities separated by the word or. Don't write any of this down yet. If you're taking notes yet, just have a look at this. The first thing I need to do in this problem, which is going to be an OR problem, right? The first thing I'm going to do is divide both sides by negative 3 because I need to isolate the absolute value. So just watch. I'm going to divide by negative 3. So this becomes the absolute value of x plus 7. And this becomes a positive 9. And Oh, I just divided by a negative number, which means I need to change the direction of my inequality symbol, which means that my isolated absolute value is now on the less than side. Less than, less than, 
which means that we would end up writing this as a compound inequality. Let's keep going with this one. Just realize that initially it was a little deceiving. We thought maybe it was going to be an or statement. It's not. It's going to be an and, which means it's going to be another compound inequality. Let's keep going. It'll only take us a few lines to work this out. So let's do the rewrite. On the next line, I'm going to let go of the absolute value symbols. I'm going to move my inequality symbol over and I'm going to negate the 9. So we've built our compound inequality without absolute value symbols now. And then we'll subtract 7 from both sides. And that's where your solutions live. Between negative 16 and positive 2, closed interval on both ends. We see the or equal to symbol, and so we need to use our square brackets or closed brackets. So this is your final answer in interval notation. Let's work the same problem. Well, let's, we'll just take a modified version of this statement. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch the direction of the inequality symbol. So let's say, uh, maybe this is, what do we want to call this? Example 13, part C. 13C. All right, we've got the absolute value of x plus 7 is less than or equal to 9. Not less. That's the one we just did. Is greater than or equal to 9. And let's try this one. Uh, greater than, great or than. Okay, so this is going to be an or statement. How do I set up an or statement? My absolute value is isolated on the great or than side. Great or, greater. So I know that I'm going to turn this into two separate statements. The first one looks exactly like the original. The other version, oh, let's write the word or, get that in there. The other version, the left-hand side stays the same. It's still x plus 7. The inequality is going to change directions. And the 9, the constant value, will change signs. Right, the, the color choices that I've made here are not super different from each other. But just realize the, the key difference is here and here. All right, the inequality symbol change directions and we use the opposite value. So now we've got these two very uh, pretty simple statements to work with. We'll subtract 7 from both sides here, maybe put a minus 7. So we've got x is greater than or equal to 2. I'll keep bringing the word or with me. Over here, I'm also going to be subtracting 7 from both sides. So we get x is less than or equal to negative 16. Could I present this now as my final answer? You could. Maybe you could even turn this into set builder notation. So, so maybe this is a way that we could see a final answer. Maybe you see it as the set of x values such that x is greater than or equal to 2 or x is less than or equal to negative 16. Close. That's possible. Could we see this on a number line? Absolutely. We're trying to draw all of the acceptable x values. Here's negative 16. Here's positive 2. Where are the x values that we like? From left to right. I like the x values that are greater than 2. That means I'm shading to the right, all the way to the right with an arrow. 
It's x is greater than or equal to 2, so we want the 2 to be part of our solution, so I'm going to put a square bracket on it. Or I can choose x values that are less than or equal to negative 16. It's got the or equal to, so I'm putting the square bracket right away. And it's x values that are less than that, so I'm going to shade with my arrow pointing to the left. This is an acceptable visual representation of all of your solutions. And again, the number line is a great place to start or to be right before you uh, express your answer using interval notation because we can read this thing from left to right. How far to the left does the shading go? All the way down to negative infinity. Can we ever get there to include it in our answer? Nope. So we put the open bracket or parenthesis. That shading comes all the way up to negative 16. And are we including negative 16 in our answer? We are. We bring that same square bracket down with us. And there's a square bracket at 2. And that shading goes all the way to the right to positive infinity. Can't ever get to positive infinity to include it in our solution. Since we can't include it, I like to put the parenthesis. We must put the parenthesis. So I can choose any x value from this interval or this interval. How do I join those two intervals together to turn them into one big answer? How do I unite them, you might say, with the union symbol? This is 100% the correct way to express your solution using interval notation, and it must have that union symbol, that U, between the two intervals. Do you feel smarter yet? You should. That was good stuff right there. So we covered the inequality, or sorry, the absolute value being on the less than side. We did two of those, those are in blue, and then we did a modified example in magenta where the isolated absolute value was on the greater than side. These are the two primary scenarios that you're going to run into. Is it possible that I could have had these two intervals and, and uh, give me another color, this interval could have been facing this way and it could have run into this other one and they end up overlapping and I have to unite them. And It's possible. Uh, I've seen it. I see it very infrequently, and you're not going to see that, I don't believe. I don't think we even run into that at this sort of introductory point in our conversations about absolute value inequality statements or inequalities in general. But it is possible that there could be some sort of off-the-wall question that does run those intervals into each other. If you see a scenario like that, realize that it's possible double check your work, make sure you've got all your inequalities facing the correct direction, greater than, less than, and so on, and make sure that you've interpreted those correctly as you put them onto a number line or into interval notation. And that, my friends, is the last section of chapter one, so if I see you again, I will be seeing you in chapter two. Thanks so much for hanging with me. See you again.